This is a Dutch Beaumont model 1871-88. I have a previous video where I restored this rifle, so go give that a watch if you missed it. In that video, I was anxious to shoot it and stumbled upon some actual 11 by 52 mm brass cases to load. Finding them was pure luck, as only a few companies ever even did limited runs in that caliber. They did work perfectly though. What most people need to do, however, is to form their own, and that's what I'm going to be doing in this video. I have some 5090 sharps brass here. This will serve as a starting point for the conversion. Beaumont die sets are available as special order, with a who knows how long lead time and an expensive price, so I'll be forming these without them. First, I want to see how the 5090 compares to the 11 by 52 brass. I'm going to measure both the fired brass, which is sized to the chamber on my rifle, and the unfired brass, which is made to spec to fit most rifles. I'll measure the rim thickness, rim diameter, base diameter, shoulder diameter, neck diameter, and the inside neck diameter. Looking at the chart, the dimensions of the fired and the unfired brass are actually pretty close, which indicates both an inspect chamber on my rifle in the quality manufacturing of the 11 by 52 brass that I have. The only area they differ by more than a few thousands is in the neck diameter, which is to be expected as that expands upon firing to release the bullet. For the 5090, the critical dimensions are close enough. The rim thickness sets the headspace. 5 thousandths off is fine for a low pressure black powder cartridge. The rim diameter is undersized by about 20 thousandths, but it's still likely enough for the extractor to grab a hold of. The base diameter at nearly 30 thousandths undersized isn't perfect, but it's as close as it matches I could find. Upon firing, the body will expand to fill the chamber. When adding the bottleneck to the 5090 brass, I want to aim for dimensions close to, but not exceeding that of the fired case to ensure that it fits into the chamber. From there, I can size the case mouth to hold the bullet. The first operation on the 5090 brass will be to trim off the excess length. Since sizing later on will impact the overall length, I'll leave some extra material and trim to 53 millimeters instead of 52. Since it's a lot of material to remove, I'll cut it off with this mini chop saw. I'll reuse this jig that I made for trimming 8x50 Siamese, laying the case down and aligning the blade to the mark. Then I can use the jaw on the vise as an end stop so that this cut is repeatable. Then I can use the lathe to clean it up. I'll put the body of the case in the chuck jaws, pulling it out so that the rim is up against the back of the jaws. There's some trial and error in getting the right length. Here, it's about 15 thousandths long. I'll put it back in the chuck. And butt the cutter up against the end. Then I can set the dial indicator on the carriage. I'll align the pointer 15 thousandths away from zero. remembering to back off the cutter, and then I can take that amount off. I'll take it out again to check. And that's just where I want it. Now I can trim the rest of the cases, 
aligning them in the check and trimming to the zero on the indicator. It's important to deburr after trimming. This tool works for inside the case mouth, but it's too small for the outside. Instead, I'll use this file, rotating the case as I drag it towards the camera. I don't want there to be any burrs that will interfere with sizing. Before sizing, I'm going to anneal the cases. Brass work hardens, so annealing will reduce the possibility of it cracking, as well as making the bottleneck easier to form. You can put a lot of thought into annealing brass cases, but for one-offs like this, I just use a propane torch and look for when the brass just starts to change color, which only takes a few seconds. I'll use this socket on a drill to hold the cases, which allows for them to be turned for even heating, as well as to act for a heat sink for the case head. I looked through all of my die sets and gathered those with the largest diameter cases. 8mm Lebel, 43 Mauser, 8x58 Danish, and the 45 Colt dies that I'll be using for neck sizing. What I'm looking for are dies that will size the brass just slightly. I'll start with the 8mm Lebel dies since they have the largest base diameter. I can take the brass and test fit the mouth on the die. I'm looking to see if the case mouth fits into the end of the die, even just a little bit. It does, so this will be the first of many dies used. Before sizing, I'll be sure to use plenty of case wax. Here's the case after running it into the Lobel sizing die. You can see that it formed a slight bottleneck here, right about the same location as on the Beaumont case. The case mouth it was reduced to 0.527. In looking for the next die, I'm not limiting myself to just the sizing dies. In a typical two die set, the sizing die matches the case dimensions and the seating die is slightly larger meant to only align the case to accept the bullet. And that's evident by these 43 Mauser dies. The case doesn't fit into the sizing die. But it fits into the seating die. I don't want to use these just yet. Instead, I'll use the expanding die from the 45 Colt set. Most dies have a small chamfer, or a round, which works to align the cases before sizing. I want the case mouth to fit in right at the end of the chamfer, where it transitions into the straight walls of the die. If the case mouth enters the die closer to the start of the chamfer, or on the flat end, it will push and crush the case. This creates a more visible bottleneck. I'll keep going, checking often while raising the ram just a little bit more each time. I'll try and match the shoulder location to that on the Beaumont case. This looks good. The case mouth now measures 0.515. Now it's a better fit against the chamfer at the start of the 43 Mauser sizing die. It creates another bottleneck. Again, I'll try to bring that down to match the existing one. The case mouth now measures 0.507. This is the idea, to reduce it just a small amount at a time to minimize the stress on the brass. 
The next two dies are from the 8x58 Danish set. I'll first use the cedar. Then it'll be small enough to fit into the sizer. The seating die reduced the case mouth to around 0 0.500. The sizing die then brought it down to 0.485. And now the inside case mouth is around the same size as on the fired brass, which means that the next dies will be those also used to reload these cases after being fired. They're both in the 45 long colt set. The seating die at point four eight two will be first. Then the sizing die at point four seven five. I'll start with the cedar. The more established bottleneck at this point provides a stop for knowing how far to push the case in. This is the fully formed case, but in order to transition into loading, the case mouth must be expanded to accept the bullet. I'll set the expander so that it's sticking out of the base of the die, and I'll be sure not to run it in too far. Now we can see how the case compares dimensionally to the Beaumont case. The rim and base measurements are still the same. The shoulder is untouched, still at 0.545, which is smaller than the fired case. The real difference is in the neck. The outside case mouth was reduced by 55 thousandths from 0.527 to 4.72. There is one dimension that's not shown here that does need to be addressed, the final length. This time to match the Beaumont case, I'll put it in the chuck. Then touch the cutter to the case mouth and zero the indicator. I'll put the newly formed brass into the chuck and make the cut. I'll give it a quick deeper. This time, the reduced diameter fits into the deburring tool. From here, they're ready to be loaded. That process is just like any other black powder cartridge, starting with belling the end. Besides the cases, the main difference with these and the cartridges loaded in the previous video are the bullets. Before, I used 0.446 diameter bullets, paper patched up to 0.452. The bore on the rifle measures 0.457, and most people use bullets meant for 4570, which is what I have here, a Lee 450 grain mold. I used it to cast these which I then lubed with a mixture of beeswax and Crisco. 
I'll seed it to an overall length of 0.254 inches, small enough to fit in the magazine. Now I'm going to address the one dimension where the 5090 brass fell short, the base diameter. Remember, it was around 30 thousandths undersized here. The brass will swell upon firing to fit the chamber, but until then, it needs additional support to ensure that it's centered and that the firing pin hits the primer in the middle. This is a simple solution. I wrap two layers of masking tape around the base, leaving a groove for the extractor to grab. There's little to no movement now. And with that, the cartridges are done. Some converted easier than others, but I think that they'll all work just fine. Not only did I convert and load the 5090 brass that I had, I also reloaded the 10 pieces of 11 by 52 that I shot in the last video. Time to head to the range. The bolt is a little stiff here. But that was the best case scenario. This is the much more common display. In the end, out of all the rounds that I had ready to go, I could only get five to chamber, but they all fired just fine. So what was the issue? These marks on the bullets are from the rifling. You can see them all around. The problem was that when these were put in the chamber, they were just too long for the rifle's throat, the unrifled part of the bore between the chamber and where the rifling starts. I seeded the bullets to the same depth as in the previous video, but there I had undersized bullets that likely fit between the rifling. A Lee 340 grain mold would have been a better choice since the front end is shorter, but for these rounds that wouldn't fit, the solution is simple. I'll just seat them deeper. I didn't crimp the case mouth, so it's just a matter of screwing the seating stem in further in the 45 cold die. Here's a comparison in lengths, before on the right and after on the left. As for the rounds that were able to fit and be fired, I'll compare the measurements. The base won't expand due to the amount of material, but it did balloon ahead of the tape. Between the tape and the shoulder, it measures 0.565, compared to 5.50 on the unfired brass. At the shoulder, it measures 0.556. and 5.45 on the unfired. Now with these expanded to fit the chamber better, I can remove the tape and check the fit in the rifle. There's no movement at all. When reloaded, these can be fired without the tape. And with that, I'll show how to reload them. As said during the brass forming process, I'll use the 45 long colt ties to bring the neck back into dimension in order to hold the bullet. The case mouth measures 0.490, so I'll start with the seating die, as I know that will bring the brass down to 0.482. I'll size only roughly half of the neck to prevent overworking the brass. 
then comes the sizing die. Then the expanding die. Now this is ready for priming and powder. Flash forward, I'll seat the bullet to the same extra depth that I brought the other rounds to. And with that, I have the same number of rounds as before. Time to head to the range again. I'll start with the four rounds that wouldn't chamber last time. They all still have the tape on them. It's still hard to close the bolt on some of them, but I got it in there. You can see how the body of the casing expanded. These cases with the tape removed should expand a little bit more near the base. I've been aiming at a large target frame so I can see where it's hitting. You can see that they're low at about 50 yards. I'll adjust the sights up to the battle sight position. I took a look through the binoculars and could see that it's hitting in the same general area. I could try raising the sight more, but with it being just a friction fit, I don't trust it to stay in position. I think that the heavier bullets are dropping faster than the mid 300 grade bullets this rifle was designed to use. I'll keep the sights where they are, I'll just have a grouping well below the target. And now that I'm onto the cases without the tape, I'll load up the magazine to see how they feed. It extracts, but it gets stuck on the next round, just like last time. I wonder if an injector would solve this problem.
Here's the target stand again. I did get two hits by aiming near the top of the stand, but in general, I aimed at the bullseye. You can see the grouping about a foot and a half low, including one hit on the wood. I'd like to try again with lighter bullets, something close to the original bullet weight. That would hopefully solve the chambering issues, as well as getting the bullet to hit closer to the point of aim. Maybe also a few more grains of black powder. The ejection issue can hopefully be solved with a replacement ejector, but that's not an issue in my mind because I had a lot of fun with this rifle. Any big bore black powder rifle is a blast to shoot, especially this one with its very modern feeling magazine. It does turn a lot of heads at the range, both the big puff of smoke when firing and the unique look of it. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.